Hello, it's David. So at the end of part three, we uh, found ourselves with a, uh, a working uh, accelerator. The alt RAM was in place. Uh, everything was behaving nicely. I had some extreme uh, programs running on the Mint desktop here. Um, but we were restricted to 64 megabytes. Well, I've gone away and worked on that. And uh, here we go. Here's our task manager on, um, on the XAES here. And hopefully you can see down the bottom here, we are, well, we've got a memory three of over 130 megabytes. And our fast total there is 122952. Obviously there's some being used by the operating system, but we are at the 128 meg uh, category. We have a look at, uh, Uh, where are we? If we have a look at this info, there we go. So we've got 128 megabytes of TT RAM along with our 14 megs. So that's not a shabby total RAM figure, there is there. Uh, does this tell us anything about our? Hardware speed, uh, no, there's nothing here about hardware speed, but you will see though, one thing that we're obviously still missing, and I'll be honest, I don't think this is a showstopper. If this doesn't work from here on in, this is getting released. I'm now happy enough with this. Uh, but one thing we're missing is the FPU, which is the main subject of today's episode, but I, I will just um, demonstrate briefly, since we, we're, we're here and we've, uh, we've got everything running, um, how that, um, memory uh, is uh, configured let's turn off and also i might as well show you it fitting in the uh, in the case so here we are with the lid off and uh, what you can see over here is i now have two jumpers uh, on the middle two pins of the uh, uh, of the configuration section um, so this is the master enable which is open it means we're running. This is the uh, ROM disable, so that's f uh, fitted. So, so that our um, flash ROM, which is not there, uh, is inhibited. And if I remove this option one jumper, and we uh, and we boot it back up, we should find we end up with only 64 megabytes allocated or available to us. And this should hopefully allow us to distribute the same firmware but um, allow the user to support both uh, 64 and 128 megabyte option there we go we've got ourselves 64 megabytes of ttram and that's just by changing that jumper so i'm hoping that that will uh, render this uh, a single uh, a single firmware And the one last thing I wanted to demonstrate before we move on to the FPU is, uh, here we go, yes, it does all work happily with it's in its case, it's just not screwed down at the moment, but you can see that that will happily close. Uh, and um, I haven't removed that jumper, so we should be seeing again 60, yeah, roughly 64 megabytes free uh, of, uh, of TT RAM there. Right, so on to the guts of today's video, which is gonna be this big old gap over here which is for a floating point unit so what we're uh, what we're going to try and do is to fit one of these PLCC 68 sockets here uh, this is um, a, a through hole component I, I, I did initially design this to be um, surface mount but actually soldering surface mount PLCCs is, is very difficult because the uh, there's hardly any room to get your your, uh, your soldering iron in and um, it, it wasn't much more work to convert this to through hole. It's pretty much a one-way process anyway, and unlike these, the PGA 168 uh, sockets, the PLCC uh, 68s are completely cheap and easy to get hold of. So um, first things first, we, uh, we're gonna check that all of our legs are straight. There's one maybe a little bit slightly bent in this corner, but otherwise, uh, you should be able to see down 
all of the rows, turn it through 90 degrees, and do the same. Yeah, so there's maybe one on this side that's just slightly off, but I think it's good enough. And uh, pin one is over here. You see it's got the square. It's got the square marking, and that's where it says U3 as well. So that's pin one. And that's indicated on the socket by, uh, by the arrow there. So the problem is you can fit these. These don't have any keying uh, holes, so you can fit these um, backwards if you're not careful. So we're going to just try and line up one corner. Just gently jiggle a bit. There we go. Fall into place. So like with all my uh, through hole work, I'm going for the uh, the chisel tip today, and my standard 290 degrees of uh, uh, of iron temperature, and we'll go for a normal technique. We'll anchor two opposite sides, and we will um, uh, we'll just get on with the boring job of uh, through hole soldering. Um, I'm still, I haven't yet got my replacement flux, so I'm still on the uh, bucket chemistry with the uh, with the old cotton bud there. So let's get this anchored. So I'm holding the center there with my finger, holding it flat, and we're going to just dip in on this side on the pins. Nice big amount of solder, and the same on this pin down here that I prepared. There we go. Now that is not properly soldered. If you have a look at that, you see that there's not really a huge amount of solder on there, but that will hold it in place. And that's all that that job is. That's just to keep it nice and flat, so I can now flip it on its head and get on with the, uh, the boring through hole process. Use this little bit of... Uh, um, uh, anti-static matting that came with the socket just to prop up the board there. I don't really want to have to be getting out the uh, um, getting out the the board holder again. So on with the uh, extraction unit and on with the fast forward. Okay, so that's the crude soldering done, uh, and uh, look at all the filth I need to deal with now. Uh, so I might just try that technique that was uh, suggested to me of uh, applying some contact cleaner first. Let's get some uh, paper towelage in here. So a bit of contact cleaner first. Rub that off with a uh, anti-static brush, and we'll follow it up with our normal IPA. Still sticky, still mucky, still needs a proper clean. Can't get between the uh, can't get between the pins properly with this, but. Uh, I have definitely seen worse after just a quick blast. So the old contact cleaner trick might be a uh, might be a good shout. I just want to get this to the point where we can test it today. Uh, then it will go back in the old uh, um, the old IPA bath. Okay. So what else is required from the point of view of getting the FPU working. Uh, I've just got a little bit of leakage around the corner there. So from the point of view of getting the FPU working, we're talking about um, potentially an oscillator, but that's optional. Uh, we do need to have one of these, we, got, we, got, we have two options basically. 
we can fit an oscillator here, which then requires on the reverse side here. Um, which way? There we go. Which then requires on the reverse side here uh, this R1, uh, and the C25 is decoupling cap, so that's a sensible proportion. So R, that requires R1 to be fitted normally 33 ohms, which connects that into the uh, the FPU's um, clock input. So that basically joins over here and goes up to the FPU's clock input. You see that via there is where this um, uh, this oscillator joins in via R1, or it goes through uh, this resistor over here, which is R. So R18 uh, is goes the one that goes to the FPU, and so if we're using the oscillator over there, then R18 just needs to be removed to uh, open up the gap here. This will drive at half. Uh, so R18 will be driving at half the frequency of R19 there, which is a CPU one. So. By default, I'm going to leave that there, and what we should do is see that the CPU, because the CPU is acting at, um, or it will be running at 50 um, megahertz, that the FPU runs at 25 uh, with the configuration as it is. So because we spent uh, that extra time fitting all of our passives the other day, um, I don't believe we need to do anything more. The, uh, I suppose the only question I've got is as to the... Um, the quality of this socket, and I've just noticed one of the pins up here is a little bit pushed back. Can you see that? Yeah, look at that. That's that's disappointing. I didn't uh, I didn't spot that before doing the soldering. So I'm not sure there's much I can do about that now. I could try desoldering that pin and pushing it through and repairing it that way. I don't know how easy that is. I'm not trying to remove a pin from this uh, this board. So I think what I might try first is uh, to fit my FBU and try it. And if it if I get poor contact, then I think what I might do is just push this in a bit, uh, as in you know um, move it towards uh, the, uh, the center. Just apply a bit of pressure like that now, actually. Uh, just to give it a bit more um, uh, positional alignment, but uh, let's um, let's pop that in and uh, see how we get on. Okay, so we've got the uh, the board just back in here. Um, configuration as before, 50 megahertz, but I have not yet fitted the FPU. I just want to make sure that the board still boots. Good, and uh, that we get our. A fast round working as before. Yep. Uh, I've got my. That's still showing me as only 64 megabytes. I've got that in the 128 megabyte configuration, so I'm just going to try that again. Feels a little bit loose. Maybe I need to get a better jumper on that. Just buy a little bit of pressure when I turn that on in case the jumper's a bit dodgy. There we go. Yep. I think it's just a bit of a dodgy jumper. Okay, excellent. So, so now it's time to fit our FPU. So go to my box of uh, CPUs. Ah, yes. Okay, this one. This one's uh, got a note on it saying that it passes at twenty-five uh, megahertz. So uh, that will be. That should be sufficient. I've just annotated that with the 25 
uh, to indicate that I've had it running at 25 in the past. So with these ones, pin one is uh, marked by the little dot at the uh, in the middle of one side. And as we saw, pin one is the one nearest to the CPU for us. So let's just uh, try and drop that into place so it lines up. There we go. Everything is aligned. I'm just gonna put my finger underneath, provide a bit of back pressure, and we'll just try and push on as many parts as we can equally. And there we go. That's just slot into place. Let's, fingers crossed, let's hope that that uh, slightly iffy looking pin in the corner makes decent contact. Okay, so let's, um, let's try again. Okay, so here we go, throwing the switch. Oh, I was nervous for a second there. That took a long time. <laughs> right. We'll do this properly this time. We'll let it reboot into its correct configuration. Now we'll just try a simple test first of all with the uh, uh, with the fractal rendering program. So uh, somewhere in here we've got fractal DSP. There it is. So if we've detected the FPU, this should show it up. Okay, so it's been detected. Now does it work? No. Damn. Okay, unfortunately it probably does mean that that pin is not making good contact. So I think we better uh, we better go back and have a look at. Actually, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put my thumb on that corner and try and run that again, just to apply a bit of pressure to that pin area. No, no. Okay, so uh, that's a shame. That's the first uh, that's the first time we've had a, a problem um, in the building of this board. So let's not be too downheartened. Let's take it out and see what we can do about that uh, that pin. Okay, so let's, uh, this is a PLCC puller by the way. Um, you can do this very, very carefully with, uh, with a very uh, fine screwdriver, but I don't recommend it. So let's get that uh, uh, FPU out of there. It's popped out quite, quite easily. Uh, and let's have a quick inspection of these, uh, of these pins again. So yeah, I'm not happy. Boy races. Yeah, so I'm not happy with that pin there. That does look like it's pushed back a long way. I'm not really sure what I can do about it. Okay, looking at it from that angle, I don't know if we can get the light on this well enough, but looking at it from that angle, if I tilt it just the right way, very, very difficult to see. But I think there is still scope for getting something in there and hooking that out, but it's going to have to be exceedingly fine. Uh, I'm not sure I have anything that could do it. This won't get, the tweezers won't get in there. If they're fine enough to get in there, actually they're not. So no, it's going to have to be something exceedingly fine, perhaps a bit of wire or uh, kind of not going to be strong enough. Uh, okay, I need to have a think. Okay, so uh, I should have caught that on camera. I'm sorry I didn't actually, but that, that worked in a way that I wasn't expecting. I've pushed that in quite a long way, as you can see there. Now that really should make a good contact, uh, if, uh, if nothing else. And the trick I used was just to use a, uh, like a drawing pin uh, style thing. And I, I just shoved, first of all, I bent the pin inwards like that. And then when it was far enough in that I could hook underneath, I bent the bottom outwards. And then I push the top back a bit as well. So um, I don't know. That's very how you're doing. Not 100% uh, not convinced that's going to do the job, but why not give it another try? So um, just double check our pins here are clean and uh, and straight. I don't think they're don't think they're the best they could be. If I'm you know being complete, completely honest. 
but I obviously have had it running before. None of them are bent, they're just, I think, a little bit... Just a bit grubby. Maybe I'll just try a quick bit of... Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, you can see a, an enormous difference there. Just getting the fiberglass pen on this a little bit. Try and buff them up a touch. Can't hurt, can it? And to me, they uh, they do appear considerably less um, look as, uh, considerably less uh, grubby at least. Okay, right. So let's go with that. So pin one back to back to where it ought to be. and we'll snap it back into place. There we go. I suppose if this still doesn't work, it's time to get out the multimeter and start checking for continuity. Make sure I've not made any uh, obvious gaffes. I mean, it did detect it, which, I, to be honest, that's a fairly low threshold, but uh, uh, it does mean at least that something is there. Right, let's try again. And we'll use the same program as before. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, different failure this time. Um, okay, we uh, we might need to move on to probing. I mean, I'm assuming that the clock is is working. That's not something that I've actually tested. That's a um, the way that we're rooting the clock as a new invention for this board. Uh, so I'll have to make sure that we've got a. Uh, um, we do actually have a clock signal in there. But again, we're detecting it, so I'm just going to try the same trick. I'm going to apply a little bit of pressure onto the chip with my thumb, with my finger underneath, just to give it a bit more possibility of connection. No, same error. Just try a few different places. No. And in this corner instead. No. So that does not look good. What about if we actually do a proper FPU? test yeah straight away so that suggests to me that either we're making very bad contact or some of our lines aren't being driven properly or even some of my logic which is an, it, this bit is new from uh, the um, from DFB 1 R4 some of my logic has not ported across properly which be uh, the first bit that hasn't but it is entirely possible Okay, so I've got the scope out here, and this is just the machines run, sat here running at the desktop. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm probing from, uh, I've got grounded off there to the chassis, and I'm, I'm probing the uh, uh, the main clock line, that's the CPU clock line, R19, and I'm seeing it's averaging at the moment, it's, it's average because this one is switched, it's averaging 19 megahertz. Um, when it's doing nothing, it obviously goes up to 50, and I'm probing the FPU line next to it and I'll tell you what it says 50.0002 megahertz so my um, divided by two function is not working or I have inadvertently forgot to apply it and there we go can you see the figure at the top there 50.0002 megahertz uh, I'll go back to the CPU line There we go, it's averaging, oh no, sorry, that's the FPU. There's the CPU, there we go, look, that's averaging 19, 19 megahertz, and you can see it, it's it's switching away, which is what you expect sitting on the desktop doing not very much. So, um, okay, there's your problem. So with any luck, a, uh, a quick firmware update should, uh, should sort us out. Okay, so I've uh, reprogrammed that now to... Um, spit out 50% all the time. Uh, it was a configurable option before and the configuration I think was just simply wrong. 
So uh, we've recognized the CPU and the, uh, the FPU and look, there we go. It is, uh, it is crunching away and the, uh, the FPU light, which is the, uh, which is the white LED there is flickering, which is great. Uh, and it's drawn our Mandelbrot. However, <laughs> have a look at my FPU socket. Uh, it's not in all the way. Basically, the problem I was having was if it is in all the way, it does not work. Let's give it a shove. That is now in all the way. Um, and when I power this on, Ah, <laughs> it's uh, it's proven me a liar. Okay, I must have just had an intermittent bad contact. But let's uh, let's try that again and see whether we can get uh, get that frac DSP program to work again. Aha! Well, that's uh, that's a nice improvement. Here we go. So we've got ourselves a. Uh, a semi-functional at least, I'm not going to say fully functional yet, FPU. The reason I say semi-functional is because until you have performed an exhaustive test, you simply do not know whether it is um, whether it's working or not. So let me do my FT FPU test here. Now this is um, DML's FPU tester function and this will go through and test all of the different all of the different operations that the FPU supports. Um, now what you might find is if I if I were to clock this now at 40 megahertz, even probably 36 megahertz, some of these would fail. And you might never notice it. You might never use the particular function that fails. I think one that always uh, one of the ones that always goes first for me is one of these RAND uh, options. One of these RAND um, operations. I can't remember which one off the top of my head. But uh, I was having that. Supposedly all 40 megahertz um, FPUs, only one of my all 40 megahertz branded FPUs runs at 40 megahertz, passes all these tests at 40 megahertz. This one you see I, I wrote 25 on, so this one I believe was previously working at 25. So uh, we've done very well to get this far. Let's see, there we go, complete, perfect. We have actually got a fully working FPU at um at 25 this is running at 25 megahertz so half the uh cpu clock rate what i normally do for my uh test of uh of the fpu is to uh to have a go at quake now there's no way that this will run quake with any speed at all it'll be like one frame a minute uh, but it does give the fpu a nice workout let me show you the uh, let me show you the um, the LEDs here. So remember that the white light indicates either DSP or FPU or the white is the one on the the extreme right, either DSP or FPU or um, reset. So well, I can promise you there's no DSP or reset going on. Uh, so that is all the FPU uh, workload. And there we go, on screen we have a lovely slideshow of Quake. Okay, with that going so well, I've decided it's time for the, uh, the final step, really. Um, I don't intend to do the flash in this series. So the final step will be to put in a separate oscillator for the FPU. So I've put in my 40 megahertz capable uh, FPU here from the DFB1R4. I've got my only 40 uh, megahertz oscillator here. So I, um, I hope this works because I, uh, I haven't got another one to, uh, to play with. And uh, we're going to fit it. So what's required is very simple. We just, and, and I'm not going to socket this because I, I genuinely don't think it's going to fit under the keyboard with the socket. So that's literally just going to drop through there we're going to solder the uh, only three I'm, I'm only going to do the three pins that are required uh, just because uh, I don't want to uh, um, 
basically I, 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 if I have to take it out I would like to be able to take it out again so the fewer pins that I can solder uh, the better or that I need to solder the better so just to verify what those are uh, without the uh, schematic hand I'll do a quick test for memory it's pin one that's not connected so I think uh, uh, so that's pin one two three four so pin four is uh, I think five volts no, no pin four is ground so that means I think pin seven is five there we go and I think uh, pin five over here is the clock uh, line there we go and we got 33 ohms which is what the resistor on the back is so the one I don't need to solder is pin one there that goes that goes nowhere so I don't need pin one so we'll pop that in so pin one is marked underneath uh, with the uh, the rare, uh, sorry the square Pad. So uh, let's uh, can I squeeze any more out of that? No. <laughs> okay. So what I'm actually going to use is the uh, is this liquid flux. Be a little bit easier to clean up, hopefully. So let's get a blob of solder on the tip. We've got our liquid flux in place, and uh, let's just try and flow that gently onto there. Good as gold. Pin one there, pin one there. Right, what we do have to do is to get rid of um, our uh, R18, I believe it was, uh, because otherwise what we're going to be doing is driving this with two different uh, oscillators which is uh, not, um, not going to be conducive to it working very well. Not quite as bad as driving a 25 megahertz chip at 50 megahertz, is it David? But yeah, still. Who would do that? So uh, yes, my silk screen here does say, he says in <laughs> Uh, my eyes aren't up to it. Uh, let's uh, let's use the camera. So, CPU and FPU clock termination may be simply bridged or tuned as desired. So I've gone with three th uh, thirty-three ohms. So R eighteen to be removed if using crystal two or oscillator two. So R eighteen. That's the uh, that's the man in question. Now I'd normally do this with hot air, but I'm thinking that uh, because it's just a little tiny SMD component, I may simply be able to knock it off with the iron. So I'll get the iron nice and clean. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is come at it from this side and just sort of gently pull it back. No, that's not uh, that's not working for me. Didn't really want to get the hot air in there with the CPU in place. I wonder if I can uh, just get the wick on it. Maybe a blob of my manky uh, flux is the way forward. Nice big blob of flux. Let's try and uh, flow that and get the wick on it. There we go. There we have it. That is the... almost, okay, we don't have the flash. That is the almost feature complete DFB1 R5. Let's see if we can get it to work and do a benchmark on that FPU. Okay, so the board's in place. Perfect.
Okay, so far so good. Let's try our FBU fractal program. It's detected the FPU. And we're running. Now, I don't know about you, I can't tell that that's any faster, but uh, I'm sure we have, uh, sure we have a, uh, a metric somewhere to do that. But just out of, for, for comparison's sake, whilst we're here, and uh, uh, I wonder if we can... Uh, hmm, just wondering if we can fix this at all. I've got a feeling... I've got a feeling Emutos, that counter works under Emutos. Let's, uh, let's see whether we can get Emutos to work for us. Okay, so it's detected 128 megabytes, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip. Uh, so I'm going to press Control to skip also uh, accessories. There we go. So it's not going to try and double allocate on memory. Uh, and let's uh, actually try to do your snip. So let's have a look for our FRAC DSP program here. Because uh, they're just you know a bit of fun. Uh, let's do let's check the software render. So this is software render at 50 megahertz with uh, with alt ram. Not bad. Not bad at all. There we go. 10 seconds software render. Try the FPU. The FPU is running at 40 megahertz, 40. Mm -hmm. It's up there. It's going to be close. Ah, oh, almost the same. 10 seconds, that's not bad. And let's try the DSP, and the DSP is at 32 megahertz. DSP nicks it, 8 seconds, but look at that, they're very, very close with that. So that particular combination, 50 megahertz CPU, 40 megahertz FPU, and 32 megahertz DSP are pretty close when it comes to that sort of number crunching. So now, in terms of uh, what we can benchmark here, um, the obvious thing to do uh, from a system speed uh, point of view is to uh, is to run uh, Christian Zietz's excellent core mark port. So I believe I've got a copy of that in here. Here we go. Now this doesn't test floating point operations. This is only integer maths, uh, but we uh, we should get a uh, a decent feel for the uh, the speed of the processor and memory combination. There we go. So we come in at uh, twenty two point six say uh, iterations per second, and uh, uh, well, I'll show you the table how that compares uh, to uh, to similar systems. Now, from the um, FPU point of view, we have Linpack here. Uh, now, Linpack uh, does a similar thing, but from the point of view of a floating point unit. So, uh, I can see the white uh, LED is on. You can't see that's just off camera, obviously. But um, there we go. So, we get a kiloflops speed. So, this is this is the equivalent. This is the uh, the rating of uh, interest for the FPU. So, a kiloflops uh, kiloflop speed around 360, 361 territory. This process uh, pretty much involves them all. I can see, you see the board's active. We're, uh, we're the bus master. We are, oh sorry, we're running at mostly full speed. We're the bus master. The, uh, that's the fainter one. If I cover the others up, maybe you can see that. The, uh, uh, the blue, oh, it's just gone off. Because this finished again. Let me run that up a second time. There we go, you can see that. Uh, that now is flickering. That's the alt ram. And then the white one next to it completely overpowers everything. That is, in this case, the the FPU. So there we go. I think I'm going to uh, declare that uh, feature complete. Uh, we've got a, a beautifully working 128 megabyte uh, TT RAM toting 50 megahertz 68030 accelerator with a 40 megahertz FPU. All fitting in the form factor of the expansion bus within the case. You do have to remove the shielding, but I don't think that that is a terrible 
place with which to leave it. We have the, uh, we have the option of adding our external um, ROM storage in the future, and that's uh, possibly something I'll uh, come back to down the line. But for now, I am content enough with this to, um, to move to publish. So keep your eyes on my DFB site on GitHub. Uh, I'll be uploading all of the uh, uh, the um, uh, the firmware source uh, in uh, in the next uh, week or two, and have at it. These can now be built uh, completely for free. All you have to do is supply the parts and assemble them yourself. Pester uh, some of your favourite builders to put a few together and uh, start selling them. I think the target price for this ought to be under £100 um, without, C without the chips, without the CPU and the FPU. Um, probably even £100 with them, to be honest, if you shop about. Uh, although you might find it difficult to get the ceramic one um, for, uh, for that. But certainly the plastic ones, that I, I also have plastic um, uh, 68030s here. And uh, these work uh, beautifully for me up to... Uh, about 40 megahertz so you could have a 40 megahertz uh, FPU and CPU no trouble at all for uh, under 100 pounds all in I'm pretty sure I think there's only one thing left to do now and that is to uh, assemble the Falcon all the way back into its case just to prove that we can and to play out with our old favorite front bench and just see the kind of figures we can get with our current setup. Thank you very much for watching. It's been a long, long journey.